Church. Our scripture lesson for today is taken from the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, and I'll be reading from Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. Once there was a pastor who liked to use live illustrations in his sermons, and one Sunday morning he brought a beautiful German shepherd to the worship service that belonged to an elderly man in the church. This elderly man loved his dog, and it was quite clear to all those who saw them together that the dog loved his master just as much. When it came time for the sermon, the pastor got up and rolled a ball across the platform and said to the dog, fetch, Sal, fetch. But the dog just sat there and would not fetch the ball for the pastor. So then the pastor had a member of the congregation come forward. He's a large, burly man, bodybuilder type, to see if he could get the dog to fetch. The huge muscle man stood over the dog, scowling and growled, fetch, dog, fetch. But the dog would not fetch. Then the pastor asked the church treasurer to come and try. He didn't have any luck either. Then he said, all right, let's try some peer pressure. And so he had all the people stand up and chant in unison, fetch, Sal, fetch. But the dog wouldn't yield to peer pressure. So then the pastor had a beautiful young woman with dark glowing brown hair, about the color of the dog's hair, came on the platform and petted him on the head. And with a soft coaxing voice, she said, Sal, please get the ball for me. Although the dog seemed to flinch just a little, he would not fetch the ball for the beautiful woman. Finally, out of frustration, the pastor called the elderly man forward with the intent to dismiss the dog. As the owner came forward, he said to the dog, Sal, go get the ball. And the dog bolted from his, where he was and retrieved the ball and gave it to his owner. After everybody settled down, the pastor asked this question very quietly, who are you fetching for? And that really is the question of our text today. You know, Romans 6, 16 in the Living Bible says this, don't you realize that you can choose your own master? You can choose sin with death or else obedience with acquittal and life. The choice is yours. You see, every one of us has a master that we serve, whether we admit it or not. That master determines our behavior and our actions. For example, if our master is money, then everything we do is centered around getting more money. If our master is power, then our lives will be centered around trying to obtain and then maintain that power. If our master is work, then and there are many workaholics to this day, nothing will come between a workaholic and their job. Just ask any kid at a sporting event whose father and or mother are not there to watch him or her play because work was more important. When my son was in kindergarten, the teacher had a Mother's Day tea in May, and my son and I sat at a little table with what I thought was another mother and her little boy. Sadly, I heard the little boy almost whispering as if ashamed and looking to the floor, faintly saying that this was not his mother, this was his nanny. The nanny later told me that the mother could have come, but didn't want to because her work always came first. How sad. The choice is ours as to who is the master of our lives. 
don't think otherwise. That mother had the opportunity to come, but she chose not to. No one else made that decision for her. So let me ask you once again, who is it that you're fetching for? Who is in charge of your life? All the people and things we can place at the center of our lives, there's only one truly that belongs there. God, our creator. We have the freedom to place other things there, and many people do. They try their darndest to do so. But in the end, these other masters are inadequate and unfulfilling. Why? Because that is the spot for God to occupy. No one or nothing else. That is how we were made. And Jeremiah understood that. In the text we just read, God told Jeremiah to get up and go watch the potter work. Now, during this time, the nation of Israel was in a time of crisis. Not so much a financial crisis or a national crisis, though that was pending, just like it is today, but rather a spiritual crisis. The nation that had belonged to God, that was blessed by God, had forgotten God. Have we? This nation belonged to God. It has been blessed by God. Have we forgotten God? We can learn much from this passage. God was no longer sitting at the center of their lives. They had forsaken God to go fetch for other things, things that brought them earthly pride and pleasure. They were fetching for the clay and not the potter. And they put God on the back burner of their lives. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We have a generation that has been brought up with little to no exposure to the church and to the good news of Jesus Christ. There was a course that was very, very popular a number of years ago called the Alpha Course. It's an evangelistic program to get those on the outside acquainted with the good news. And in the Alpha Course, at the very beginning, there's a clip that showed the leaders of the church going out and asking random people on a busy city street questions. And one of the questions was simply, who is Jesus? Do you know that one out of four people were the only ones that had a clue? One, and three did not. Astounding, but that's true. We as a nation have all but forgotten God. God loves us so much that he gave us his only begotten son to die for us. You know, he's not going to sit idly by while his people go after other things to replace him. God will not settle for second place in our lives. God tells Jeremiah to go to the potter's house, and Jeremiah does it. He doesn't say, oh, it's too early in the morning, I'll go later. He doesn't say, I've been there before. I know what the potter does. I don't need to go again. No, he listened to God. He didn't understand why he was being sent to the potter's house, but he was obedient. He went and saw the potter that day. And when he watched the potter, he learned a valuable lesson. You know, look at verse three of our text that I just read. Verse 3 said, So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. That's the first part. But then the second part in verse 4, But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Interesting. First notice that the pot he was shaping was marred in the potter's hands. It doesn't say the potter marred it. It just said it was marred. The clay was resisting the touch of the potter so that the original design became flawed. What a wonderful illustration of not only mankind, but of creation. The word tells us that after God created everything, he looked around and he said, it is all very good. And then what happened? Was that he gave one commandment follow. 
and it wasn't followed. When that commandment was broken, we all became rebellious because it's affected everything. We live in a moral world. We don't have to look very far to realize that, do we? I mean, just look at the headlines this week. I mean, so many things going on in the world. The, the, the Russian and Ukraine war, and now the, the, the Russians are, the military and the people that they've tried to get in to help them are at war with each other. And it's, it's just become a big circus. But it's not a circus because people are dying. People are suffering because they want power. Russia wants power over Ukraine. And it's just a mess. Or you pick up any day now, there's been random shootings. Children, adults, elderly. It's unbelievable. There's murder happening every day, almost in a lot of places. It's just unbelievable. Even nature has gotten into the act. And I'm not here to discuss politics, and I'm not going there. But all we have to do is to notice that something strange is happening in our world today. The hurricanes, the tornadoes, the drought, the flooding. I mean, you name it, it's happening all over. Wow. Wow. The clay on the potter's wheel was marred. But the beautiful thing is, what happens next? The potter did not throw the marred piece, the ruined piece, into the corner or into the trash. He continued working with it and reshaped it into another vessel which he deemed good to make. In other words, he began again from scratch with the same clay and gave it a shape that was good. In verse 6, God says to Jeremiah, to go and tell his people, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. When we are found flawed, I have good news for you. God can remake us. When we fall apart at the seams, God can put us back together again. God wasn't through with the clay, despite what it looked like, despite how ugly it had become, despite the flaws that were in it. God was telling Jeremiah to tell the people, yes, you have messed up. Yes, you have disobeyed, but I can still rework you. I can still form you into a vessel that is useful. I'm not through with you yet. Now, many of us at times may feel like we're no longer useful to God. We're a cracked pot <laughs> with too many flaws, too many mistakes, too many stains. Well, here's the good news. If anyone is in Christ, that person is a new person, a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 God can rework the old clay and turn it into something wonderful. God later tells Jeremiah that if a nation that was doomed to destruction repents, then guess what? God will give them another chance. And guess what? If we have failed, if we have made a mess of our lives, then let me tell you that God is still at the potter's wheel today, ready to rework our lives into something wonderful. God is willing to rework our lives, no matter how more it may have become. But here's the thing. We have to yield to him. If we go fetching for anybody else or anything else but God, then we're not going to be a vessel that honors God. We must recognize that God is the potter and we are the clay. That means that God is the one in charge and we are not. God made us, each one of us unique. It's a design for our lives with a purpose for our lives. When the potter sits down to make his pottery, he has something in mind of what he wants it to look like. 
And much in the same way, God has made each one of us. He has a plan for our lives. And God will work in us as he seems fit, which is not always what we see fit. God works in us what is best for him, which ultimately, which is what is best for us. Although sometimes it may not seem like that at the time. But he can only do that. He can only give us a second chance. He can only take the mess that we've made from our lives and make a new creature out of it if we let him. Will you yield to God's touch today? Will you give him your life, your all? The song that was played before the sermon is called, I Surrender All. Not half, not a part, not even 99%. It's I surrender all. Will you allow him to be in charge of your life, to make you and mold you as he seems fit? Or will you spend your life fetching for other things? The choice is yours. What will you do? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of second chances. We thank you that because you created us, you're able to mold us into something different than the mess that we have made in our lives. You can make us into a new creature, but we must let you. Father God, I just pray, whoever is in the sound of my voice, that Lord, they will take seriously this, this love that you have for us, your willingness to come alongside of us and remold us into something beautiful. But we have to let you. Father, help us to let go of the things that do not matter and claim the one thing that does, and that is you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.